event on disruptive companies. For those of you who don't know Dias, just a very brief introduction because I don't want you want to be between disruptive companies and Tiger introduction. We have a start panel today, so I, I'm also curious to listen to them. So at Thai South Coast, which is combination of San Diego and Orange County, entrepreneurs come together, network, do events like this. Slides are not up. A partner at uh, Kenobi Martin is helping me with the IT. <laughs> So I think uh, the idea of Thai is to bring together entrepreneurs through this uh, monthly events that we do. Uh, last event that we did was AI in healthcare. We had a very good uh, turnout, uh, 100 plus people. I think today also, uh, I think we should have about uh, similar uh, turnout. And uh, we shared knowledge. Uh, we work together uh, and create opportunities. We've done funding. Uh, by the way, Thai also has a fund called South Coast Angel Fund, and we've invested so far in seven companies, uh, really stellar uh, companies that we've invested in. So we also, I think, want to create this entrepreneurial ecosystem through investing, through mentoring, through helping them on board composition, on uh, alliances, and various uh, aspects of creating a company. Thai's origin were uh, successful entrepreneurs who took their company from zero to a billion dollars, came together in Silicon Valley, and today it, it has grown to 61 chapters across the globe. I think The Economist magazine has rated one of the largest entrepreneurial organizations. We are a nonprofit, so none of us get any salaries, no pay, nothing. <laughs> Um, I think uh, the key members that are part of Thai are business leaders, venture capitalists, lawyers, management professionals, um, you know, various uh, uh, corporate uh, that uh, we've had as sponsors. So I think uh, we've had pretty good uh, diversity in terms of our members, which the industry is uh, technology and software, uh, banking, uh, venture capital, uh, consulting, healthcare, life sciences, many, many, many of them. <clears throat> the charter members are a pillar of our organization, and these charter members uh, help create this uh, tie. And we have in San Diego uh, chapter, we have about 32 cha charter members. Uh, I want to welcome our new charter members today, uh, Rajiv Grover. Joy, uh, some of them BK and others are not able to make it, but uh, they are also our charter members. And uh, you can talk to them. Some of them are, uh, you know, Sujit has been at UCSD, but a very successful entrepreneur. He has created company. That company has been acquired, and you know, so and. He's creating another company now, and you'll hear about it. So Rajiv Grover is a leader in education. He has also been an executive at uh, companies, and uh, you know I think uh, we have uh, learned something from him that he can also help us as an organization. And Hansu Choi, he is a great supporter of Thai. This facility 
What do you think of this facility? Awesome. Thank you, Hansu, and thank you, Kanobi Martin. By the way, um, I've been executive at various companies, public companies and all that. I've been officer of public companies. We've used uh, Kanobi Martin. Um, I, want to, I don't want to put a, put a plug or anything, but they are like top intellectual property firm in the country. So uh, we have events that promote um, entrepreneurship and social networking together. And through social networking, you know, a lot of companies are created, a lot of uh, 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 organizations are created, and uh, I think uh, that's where a lot of business is done. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, so glad. And there's always something happening. And next month, uh, there was an event called TICON 2023, TICON is a global event that happens in Silicon Valley every year, and who's who of the industry will be at that TICON event. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, last time I was there, there was CEO of Microsoft, uh, Adobe, uh, you know, Palo Alto Networks, and many, many uh, organizations. And uh, this year, I think the theme has been variety of themes in AI and uh, life sciences, digital health, uh, things like that. So I think you will hear, you will get to see a lot what, what's happening in terms of trends and uh, what, uh, you know, what things are getting funded, what uh, are, uh, you know, uh, what things are achieving successes. So that's what I, I would say TIE is about. Next, I would like to invite uh, Hansu Choi, who is the partner at uh, Kenobi Martin to say a few words. Very excited about hosting uh, another great PI event tonight, Disruptive Startups. Uh, my name is Hong Su Choi. I've been with the uh, firm uh, over 22 years, uh, handling electrical computer, net device, AI, and semiconductor area. We have been hosting uh, and sponsoring uh, Thai for the past, uh, I mean, over the past 10 years. And uh, we are very uh, proud to sponsor. And I was a charter member of pre-pandemic, and then I didn't do anything during the pandemic, but I, I was able to re-engage uh, with the charter membership. Um, <coughs> since we are working with um, startups, I wanted to briefly um, explain uh, what we do. So, um, Konobi Martins, we are one of the largest IP firms in the country, uh, seven offices nationwide. Uh, San Diego is the second largest uh, office with about 120 uh, people uh, having uh, BP also attorneys. We do only IP patents, uh, trademark, copyright, licensing, litigation, and covering all sorts of technologies from med device, uh, biotech, to AI. And we are working with many uh, technology startups. <coughs> Uh, these are deals that we help for our clients. I wanted to point out that we help develop very good, uh, strong IP portfolio that um, eventually help uh, uh, enhance the company valuation significantly. Uh, hopefully, many of you can be successful down the road. So this is a um, recent LA uh, Daily Journal uh, saying we are shooting for um, number one IP firm in the, in the world. And uh, we are consistently ranked as a top tier firm in many uh, areas of IP. Again, um, when you have any IP questions, feel free to uh, contact us. And uh, thank you again for coming to our law firm. Uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you, Hunsu. Uh, next, I would like to uh, mention something about, uh, we not only uh, network with adults, but we also are training our young kids, high school students,
to be entrepreneurs. We have a program called Thai Young Entrepreneurs that was founded by Jazz Graywald. She is here. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, it's been going on for many years now. And high school students who have graduated from these programs have done very well. Some of them have their own startups. One of the startups that I mentored with won the global competition and also uh, has uh, their own startup that is funded well. And, you know, they, they've gotten admission in very good schools like Stanford, Columbia, uh, things like that. So I think uh, this uh, program has had very good success. Uh, in June, uh, we are planning to do, uh, or we are hosting this uh, global competition here in San Diego. So they've chosen Thai global competition here in San Diego. And I'm so glad that they, they're doing that because I think now San Diego is considered to be one of the capital of entrepreneurship, uh, you know, where there is intersection of tech, wireless, biotech, uh, digital health, and all, all the different uh, uh, disciplines. So I would like to invite Amrish, who is our charter member, to talk about the TYE, Thai Global Competition. Thanks, Nadesh. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, so my kids who are actually here in the audience, they were part of the TYE this year. And it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, I think there are very few organizations which actually teach hands on of how to bring an idea into a product. And you know, there is, there is disproportionately low material available on this concept, if you think about it, all the uh, known wisdom <laughs> out in the market. So I've been very thankful to TIE, uh, and more, most importantly, the people who actually conduct it are the one who has done that idea to product successfully in their life. So those are the people who are training into the TIE, and <coughs> looking forward to it. I think this next year, it's going to be another uh, the, the admission for the next year is going to start pretty soon. So if any one of you are interested, or if any one of you know the kids who are in high school or that area, it's a pretty fantastic program. We also had a Bay Area trip that was where we covered, we actually went in the campus of NVIDIA, Google, Microsoft, and whatnot. So it was quite a bit of an experience. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amrish. So next, I would like to introduce the star of today's program. None other than Mark Bowles. Mark Bowles, we are really honored to have him. And Mark Bowles is a serial entrepreneur. He has done eight companies, founded eight companies. He has raised $350 million has 100 patents. He is just amazing, and I think there's no one other than Mark can do this disruptive company uh, panel. So I would like to invite Mark to start the panel. Mark. A cheap look at my notes. Um, Welcome to the night's uh, Thai coast. You know, the tagline here is foster innovation, and hopefully we can do that tonight uh, by talking to some of the best innovators here in town. Um, I'm going to do my best to moderate this panel uh, uh, of luminaries. Um, I did want to echo one thing. We heard a lot about Thai, but I spent uh, a Saturday, and my, my, one of my sons spent a Saturday with the TYE group. Um, if you have children and you don't take advantage of this group, I've not seen in my lifetime a collection of 20 kids that give up, I don't know, six, eight weeks of Saturdays and they go sit in the springtime and they're indoors listening to people like me talk about entrepreneurship. These are the brightest kids. Their parents come with them, a lot of them. They have their own business plans that are not bad plans. They're great plans and uh, these are the nicest, smartest kids, and so if your kids have any passion or, or if you want them to learn a passion for, um, for entrepreneurship and innovation, don't miss the opportunity to get involved with this group. 
Um, the panel we've assembled here today um, is to highlight San Diego's based companies that are potentially very disruptive. It was not intentional that all these companies are biotech healthcare related, but it's probably a good thing that they are because I think that space needs as much disruption as any space. Um, and San Diego probably has many uh, tech sector companies that are disruptive as well. We just didn't uh, invite those folks tonight. Maybe we do a different panel, a different night. So the general flow for this evening will be, I'll start off with just a few quick slides to set the, set the stage for what uh, we mean by disruptive innovation. And then I'll introduce the four panelists. Each of the panelists will then do a quick presentation of their company and the disruptive nature of those companies and technologies. Uh, and then I'll begin the panel discussion where I'll probe the panelists a bit deeper about how and who they disrupt and what the future looks like when these disruptions occur. And then we'll open it up to you, the audience, uh, for some Q&A before we wrap up. Uh, we'd like to save most of the questions uh, to the end. However, if you have a burning question at the end of each presenter's uh, segment, I suppose we could allow one or two at that time. Does that sound like a good plan? Yes. Okay. Then what is, oh, I need my slide deck. How do I find that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there. Yeah. Thank you. Control L. Let you play one on TV. <laughs> okay, what is disruptive innovation? Um, so, first, the innovation we're familiar with is sustaining innovation. It's sort of a normal pace of innovation, uh, continuous, evolutionary, incremental, and often conservative. That works, and it works well. Um, it's the bulk of the market. But then there is disruptive innovation uh, that is when it's game-changing, radical, revolutionary breakthroughs happen and upend the status quo very quickly. Uh, one of the most common characteristics of successful disruptive innovations, uh, there's enabling technology, innovation business model, innovative business model, and coherent value networks. Um, so just briefly on those, um, an enabling technology is one that makes uh, a, the product or service more affordable to a wider population. Think of Ford with its invention of the assembly line that produced the price, reduced the price of the car dramatically. Second is the innovation in business model that makes the product or service ubiquitous where it was rare before. Think of FedEx with the invention of express mail and overnight delivery via airframe. And finally, coherent value network where the entire market ecosystem Perhaps suppliers, partners, distributors, customers all adopt a new technology simultaneously because its value proposition is markedly better than what's previously existed. Think of Uber disrupting the taxi business almost overnight. Some examples, some more examples. Uh, <clears throat> Alibaba Group. Uh, they don't own any goods, but they're the world's biggest retailer. Airbnb is the largest provider of accommodation, does not own any real estate. Uber, the largest taxi firm in the world, doesn't own a single vehicle. And Facebook, the largest media company, doesn't create content. Uh, as I mentioned, Ford, it was all hand assembled one at a time, and then they came up with the innovation of the assembly line, and it drove the prices down and uh, made cars affordable to more and more people. We're all familiar with the uh, Netflix blockbuster uh, overnight, not overnight, but over a few years, they put those guys out of business. And it's not just startups that do it, big companies do it as well. If you think about Apple and some of these other companies, they uh, continue to innovate the iPod, the first the laptop, the iPod, uh, the iPhone, and so forth. Um, so disruptive companies aren't just elsewhere. They're here in San Diego. The four disruptive companies here tonight that we're going <coughs> to have a panel with are uh, Plano, Peter, uh, multi-omics company, 
Truvium, a blood diagnostics company with Dina, Cardia, a bioprocessing unit, Mike will talk about that, and Cypria AI, uh, Chronic Healthcare AI. Okay, Dina, you are up first. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Right. I did try this earlier. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, disrupting blood testing. Need the mic. Mic. Can you hear me now? There we go. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So a little bit about Truvian. So we were founded in late 2015, and our vision was to develop uh, an automated and integrated blood testing analyzer that would make routine blood testing more convenient, more affordable, more accessible for people. Um, I can't take credit for the idea, but actually my co-founders, Peter and Mark, originated the idea, and it actually came out of EcoATM. So you may, might be familiar, I know there's at least one person uh, that actually worked at the company that's here today, um, but EcoATM was a, a, and is a product that, it's a kiosk, and basically what you can do is you can take your phone, um, hook it up to this kiosk. Mike, please. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. Hook it up to the kiosk, and then um, it runs a diagnostic on your phone, and it will basically give you cash for the phone and then recycle your parts. And so they did an amazing job on this technology. It was bought by the big kiosk company Outer Wall um, in July of 2013 for $350 million. But as they were creating these partnerships in retail, um, basically what they were hearing was retail is going into healthcare. We're trying to leverage a footprint in our store to do uh, more healthcare type of testing and we're very interested in blood testing specifically. And so that was kind of data point number one and they were hearing that in multiple different retailers. Um, around the same time, you might remember or uh, know the lady with the black turtleneck, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, um, Theranos was emerging as you know, a leader um, in the blood testing space. Um, and this was really at the heydays. They had just formed a partnership with Walgreens where they were gonna be placing their blood testing technology in the footprint of those stores to enable that vision. Um, and then what ended up happening, which we know a lot more about now than we did back then, um, was there the technology didn't work, there was a lot of fraud and bad behavior, and essentially what happened was they, uh, had to pivot and they took blood in the stores and then they shipped it out to a clinical laboratory in the Palo Alto area to run testing and they did that also incorrectly. But we didn't know a lot about what was going on. We saw the vision, we heard the feedback from the retailer and we in the, the retail space and we said, okay, um, we know that there's a need. Um, Theranos has a great vision, but we didn't see the product that would be right there in the store that would help realize uh, this vision. Um, so, um, we put the company together in September of 2015, got seed uh, funding from a venture capitalist uh, domain, um, Kim Kamdar, um, here in the San Diego area. She took on the acting uh, founding CEO role, and then within a month, um, the first Wall Street Journal expose happened, and there was a whole unraveling of Theranos. And so, if anyone's interested in that story, I'd be happy to kind of tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but on to Truvian. So blood testing is really important. Um, the majority of medical decisions um, are based on lab test results. It's how we manage chronic disease. It's how we um, prevent um, illness. Um, but given that, only 40% of patients, um, or actually 40% of patients, they skip their getting their blood testing. And so why is that? And don't look at your neighbors. Um, there's many of us, including myself, um, that decided to skip um, getting blood testing, but why do we do that? It's because there's a lot of steps, it's inconvenient, it costs money, and at the end of the day, when you get your results, you're no longer with your healthcare provider and you can't talk about what those results mean for you. Um, and so if you go to see your doctor for your yearly exam, um, this process will probably sound familiar. It's, um, it's laden with friction. Um, you have to schedule a visit at, uh, at the doctor, you go see your doctor, um, you're waiting in the waiting room, you visit with the doctor, they do all the vitals and all of that, they talk to you, and then at the end of the visit, they say, hey, you should go get your blood drawn so we can see how you're doing. And then you have to go somewhere else, typically, maybe it's a different room in the facility, maybe it's a draw site off-site, 
but you go and get your blood drawn, and typically it's three tubes of blood. They collect that blood and they send it out to large core laboratories that run that, those blood samples on large analyzers. And the reason that they're collecting multiple tubes of blood is because there's multiple different types of instruments that process those blood samples. And so you need a different tube for each instrument. And then after those blood samples are processed, the results are then available, but now it could be next day, it could be several days um, in many parts of the US and you're no longer with your healthcare provider. And so that's the current process uh, today, and what we're trying to do is reimagine that process and make it much simpler, much easier, and take out that friction. And so with the Truvian system, we're gonna place that directly where the blood's being drawn, so that you come in, you see the healthcare provider, you get your blood drawn right away, it goes right into the device, and then you're able to have the conversation with your healthcare provider about your results before you leave the clinic. So that's what the future will look like. And so what is our technology? Um, it's an automated and integrated blood testing analyzer. It's about the size of a desktop, and I'll, I'll show you a quick video so that you can see it. Um, and the unique attributes of the device, which has really never been done before, is we can enable chemistry, hematology, as well as immunoassays in the same small footprint with a small amount of blood, um, and deliver core laboratory or reference laboratory quality performance. Um, the first panel that we're looking to get cleared through the FDA, we call it the True Wellness Panel. It has 32 tests. These are the most frequently ordered tests um, in the U.S., and some of these will probably sound familiar to you. Um, it's your comprehensive metabolic panel, which is predominantly chemistries, your complete blood cell count, which is your hematology, your lipid panel, which is you know your cholesterol, HDL, and, and, and more of like a healthy heart type of panel. Those are also chemistries and then two amino assays, your thyroid uh, TSH, and then hemoglobin A1C, which is a diabetes uh, marker. And it's a really simple workflow, um, and it has to be simple because this is not going into central labs, but in distributed settings, in point of care settings. Um, and so essentially um, what you do is you collect the blood sample. You only need 300 microliters for that full panel that I just mentioned. You put the blood sample into our consumables, and we have a support pack and we have a disc. You place these into the device and there's a touchscreen interface and you can run the panel and then within 20 to 45 minutes, depending out on how many tests you want to see and look at, you can get your full panel of results on the screen. You can print them, it can connect into an EMR. And so, you know, I, I would say in terms of disruption, um, you know, we've taken, sometimes the sexiest technologies aren't the ones that you want to go to. They sound really cool. Um, they're very clever, um, but they can't get you there. And especially coming in this space, um, you, the most important thing is you have to deliver accurate results. And so what we've decided to do is take proven technologies, we call them tried and true, and integrate them into a small footprint and leverage all the work that's been done in years and years of diagnostics. So um, the consumables are, are very uh, straightforward. I can uh, give you uh, a, a look at them. Um, but essentially, everything that you need to run a full panel of tests is on those consumables. So there's no tubing, there's no you know, buffers outside the device. It has all the reagents and chemistries that you need to run uh, the full panel in. And when you're done with those consumables, you throw them out at the end. And then with regards to the analyzer, we have different optical modules um, that are uh, essentially tried and true kind of uh, techniques. So we use an absorbance module, we do absorbance assays for chemistry, we have a uh, fluorescent uh, confocal scanning technology that helps us to do amino assays, fluorescent amino assays, and then we leverage a digital pathology concept um, for hematology assays. And so what we wanted to do when we you know, kind of came up with the design of the product is we wanted to make, again, the product as simple as possible for the places and locations we're gonna put the device in. And so one of the things that we needed to do was eliminate all pre-analytical steps. And so one of the first things that happens when you draw blood um, at these sites is they have a centrifuge and they spin down the blood for chemistry assays and they isolate that plasma and then that plasma is used for all of your chemistry tests. And so with um, our uh, consumable, our disc, we have two plasma separation features on board the disc. And so in the device, once the whole blood is, is added, um, the, the device will take the blood, it will dispense it into those features, the disc spins, and that plasma is then separated, purified, and can be used for chemistry assays. 
We've also converted a standard QVET sort of absorbance technology, you may remember from, you know, kind of Chem 101 and Beer's Law, into micro wells on the disk. And so you can kind of think of all of these little wells around the disk, those are little, uh, essentially, um, QVETs. Um, and we've miniaturized chemistry reactions, but using tried and true chemistries onto the device. And then when you take the plasma separation, you take you know, your little micro QVETs, and you adopt that with standard absorbance methodologies, that's how you're able to get your chemistry readouts. And so it's really the integration of all of these things that was part of uh, the disruption. Um, and just recently, what we've been able to achieve is um, a pretty big milestone. Um, one of the biggest critiques of Theranos was that, you know, they were claiming all this great data, but they didn't allow anyone to, you know, come into their facility, you know, look at their um, instruments, run their instruments. Um, recently, Peter and, and Mark actually came uh, to Truvian and ran their own samples on the machine. That was a really fun experience. Um, but just recently, we shipped uh, three of these devices to an external site, a clinical trial site, and we had them evaluate the performance of our device versus uh, central lab testing. Um, and it was highly concordant. We were really encouraged and excited about the data, and we were just accepted into AACC, which is an annual uh, laboratory medicine conference, um, and we'll be sharing that data um, later this summer. And so I think the future of blood testing is looking pretty good. Um, and if I have one more minute, I'll just show you a quick video of how it works. You can kind of see it. And then I will hand it off to um, Peter. So here's the device. You can get an idea of the footprint. It's on the lab. And again, the first step is you're going to collect your sample, 300 microliters for a full panel. And then through the user interface, you can enter in patient details about the patient, their birth date, their uh, sex. Um, then you open the drawer, the screen tells you you need to mix that sample, you place that sample into the support pack, and then you take the support pack and the disc, you put it into the device. Um, that's really all the user has to do. Then you start the test, and again, everything else is going to happen inside the device. It issues a timer, counts down, and then at the end of the run, it'll say, I'm done. Um, no song like that, though and uh, the drawer will open, and all of those consumables can then be disposed. And then when the last step is that the report is displayed on the device, and then again, you can print that to, uh, report on a physical piece of paper, or it can connect into an electronic medical record. So thank you so much, and I will uh, turn it over to Peter. You didn't like to, I actually messed up here. I meant to introduce the panelists. I didn't do that. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Dina. Hi. <laughs> uh, Dina Marinucci is a co-founder of Truvian. Um, she's about to disrupt the $80 billion blood diagnostic business. Dina is also a PhD in serial entrepreneur, having previously co-founded Epic Sciences, if you're familiar with them. Uh, Dina and the team are here in San Diego achieving the near impossible goal that Toronto set out to do but couldn't make work with nearly a billion dollars invested in BC money in a decade working on it. Um, keep an eye on Truvian over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and by the way, one thing to set the record straight, record straight, Peter actually came to me with the idea that for the blood testing that I <coughs> had just been asked by several retailers about you know, could you automate things in the pharmacy and, you know, blood testing and so forth. So it's really Peter's idea. I just sort of validated it and went along with him. So, so that's a quick lead-up. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, Toronto's was worth $10 billion, uh, $9 billion, and it didn't even work. So if this works, it's got to be worth like $100 billion, right? Uh, um, okay. Next is uh, Plano, Peter Van Rome a multi-omics diagnostic platform being developed uh, here in San Diego. Peter's a PhD, over 150 issued patents and more pending, a serial entrepreneur. Zyre uh, was his first company that was across the parking lot here when he moved from South Africa. Uh, Eco ATM, he was a co-founder with me there. Etico, he sold to Illumina a few years ago. Truvian, as we've explained. And now Plano, which is pretty exciting, it's where his sort of communication wireless background meets biology and he's going to apply a bunch of the 
tech stuff, uh, communication system stuff to, uh, to biotech. Um, all of Peter's exits have been 100 million plus, so keep an eye on Plano. I think this will be his biggest one yet. Um, let me introduce the other two guys because I messed up. Uh, Michael Elton, he is a CEO at Cardia. Michael's also a veteran of the startup world, serial entrepreneur uh, on both the investment side and the operating side. Uh, Cardia's bioprocessing unit, a BPU, uh, aims to uh, bring a brand new type of biology based uh, transistor to the market. They're used as uh, digital biosensors around for detecting the actual signals that make up biology and not just a proxy signal. His vision is that this will eventually power the internet of biology. We'll let him have to explain that to you. Uh, to more rapidly advance our understanding of human biology. Uh, and finally, Dr. Sajit Day. Uh, he is a Jacobs Family Endowed Chair in Management and Engineering and Leadership at the University of California, San Diego and about 10 other things that I didn't have time to list here. Um, Sudeet has been prolific in wireless innovation is, uh, and in supporting entrepreneurship at USD in San Diego for nearly 25 years. Zipper AI is his first startup in the AI space and is aiming his disruptive AI at the chronic healthcare management sector. Please welcome our panelist. Um, and now it's Peter's time. Sorry for uh, getting that out of order. Hi, good evening everyone and thank you Mark and uh, thank you um, for uh, the lead up um, of Trugan. So what Trugan uh, is doing is, as you've heard, is doing blood testing. So and that's uh, on the chemical side, the proteomics, immunotherapy side and also um, a, a CBC. So what we're doing is more on the molecular diagnostic side. So in other words, it's looking at DNA and um, the use cases of all of that. So I thought the best way to explain what we're doing and why it's disruptive what we're doing is to use, uh, to explain a use case that uh, one of our customers are using, uh, our instrument for and our technology for. <coughs> so our technology, so this specific example is for non-small cell lung cancer. And um, what happens in <coughs> molecular diagnostics related to um, cancer screening is um, you look at the signature of the, the cancer uh, cells and based on the signature of that cell, even if it's lung cancer, for instance, it could have different, um, different versions of, of the cancer. So in other words, you need to determine what kind of uh, signature the cell has and then the therapy is associated with, uh, with the specific signature of the cell. Uh, that, uh, that, that, you, that the patient has. So um, how that works, the best way to explain it is really to look at the standard of care for non-small um, um, <coughs> uh, cell lung, lung cancer. So what happens, of course, when a patient has symptoms, they go for a MRI scan, and the end result is, is there's either no tumors, um, or, of course, uh, when there is a tumor, uh, the, the key thing is to determine if it's cancerous or not. <coughs> and that's normally done with a biopsy, looking at the, um, at the morphology of the cells uh, through a microscope, and then, uh, you know, it's determined just by visualizing, uh, looking at the cells to determine if, if it's a cancer cell or a non-cancer cell. <coughs> now, when it is a cancer cell, um, as I mentioned, you want to understand the signature of, of the uh, cancer. So you look at the, the cell itself to see what the mutations are in there. And the interesting thing, of course, is that cancer is actually a, um, uh, it's, it's actually a genetic disease. So it's the mutations of the cell that, um, that creates the cancer. So then, by, so you cannot tell from the morphology of the cells what kind of treatment to use. So you need to then look at um, the signature of the DNA of the cell, and that's normally done using next-gen sequencing. Probably all out of Illumina and, um, you know, the way that they do things. So they don't know, <coughs> you don't know what the signature is, but by sequencing it, you look at uh, the letters one at a time, and then you can say, oh, well, it's this kind of cancer, and then you need to use this kind of therapy. 
Um, and then, of course, you, you get the therapy selection. The, the issue at the moment with the standard of care is that a turnaround time from uh, the biopsy all the way to actually uh, the, after the sequencing to the therapy selection that's available takes roughly on average 25 days. So it's quite a long time. And um, one might think that, well, maybe it's not that bad, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe a month, but you can start treatment in the meantime. And that's indeed what happens. 27% of the patients that are diagnosed with cancer start therapy. And if it's the wrong therapy, this is typically what the, um, what the life expectancy looks like. So in other words, after a period of uh, time, the survival rate's about 10%. That's if you use the wrong therapy. <coughs> so it's, it's crucial to get that information early on. But you might say, well, 25 days, um, you know, once you know what therapy is the right therapy, even if you started off with the wrong therapy, um, you just switch and then the patient should start to get better. But the reality of it is that this is basically the um, life expectancy if you start off with the wrong therapy uh, for a specific cancer. <coughs> so, what we do is we develop technology that um, can be placed close to the patient care, uh, like uh, in uh, hospital labs, for instance, and the turnaround time can go from this 25 plus days uh, to about eight hours. So, in other words, you can do three 96 well samples, 90, uh, 96 well played, every eight hours. And uh, in other words, you can do three times 96 samples in, uh, in basically a day. So uh, the whole point here is that we can basically, the impact that we have in the, te in the technology that we're developing is that you can basically get the right treatment early on as soon as you um, are diagnosed with cancer. And one of our key customers is using this technology and we're busy developing this technology with it. So it really has a big impact, and it's a direct impact that uh, you know will affect many people's lives. So how do we do it? So we've all heard of PCR, <coughs> and PCR is normally what uh, they use what's called TACMAN probes, especially after COVID, we all have heard of uh, PCR ad nauseum, I'm sure. And uh, what TACMAN probes does, think of TACMAN uh, probes, if you think of a telecommunication system, it's, it's roughly the equivalent of a two-way radio. The old two-way radios where you have point-to-point -point communication, it's noisy. You can basically just have one person on a certain frequency. That's how TACMAN probes work. So it's one wavelength of fluoroforce, and then you can uh, detect one specific target. So the technology what, that what we're developing um, is using some of my background in telecommunications. <coughs> we're all familiar with Qualcomm and their CDMA system, co-division multiple access. So what we do is we're basically implementing something like a communication system, a, code, a CDMA system, co-division multiple access system in, um, in biochemistry. So we, <coughs> we detect these targets using uh, what we call a planoid, very innovative name. <laughs> um, and then we assign a code to, um, to, uh, to each target. So in other words, each, each target that you're looking for in a sample is assigned a unique code. And then we decode, we put all these codes together, all the targets, and then we can increase the number of targets to, let's say, 10,000. So that's the real innovation here, is we're using telecommunications principles, implementing that in biochemistry, and um, in this way we can implement and um, more of these complicated um, genomic based molecular assays. One of those, of course, is therapy selection, but that's with just one example. There are quite a number of other examples um, where molecular testing is being used. <coughs> so. Uh, so we're basically extending the use of um, PCR, uh, where the, you can look for one target to thousands of targets. And, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it's for, um, for, um, for these kinds of applications uh, required to have many different targets. So the alternative to using our technology is sequencing. And as I mentioned, the problem with sequencing is very expensive. It takes a long time. 
And uh, so this is a streamlined, simple way of uh, extending the capabilities of, uh, of the simplicity of PCR to significantly more complicated applications. And what we're doing is we're developing an instrument, not unlike the one that's, uh, that Truvian is developing. Uh, it's not a point of care unit, it's uh, for lab use. Uh, we also have a consumable and reagents that we sell. So it's a 96 well plate for those who are familiar with um, you know, sort of general lab use. It's a standard 96 well plate. Um, then we develop these plenoids for specific applications together with our customers. And what's very important, <coughs> the way that things are going in uh, clinical testing is that it's uh, multi-omic uh, testing is required. So we go from DNA, we can detect DNA, RNA, methylation, proteins, all those things together at the same time on the same plate, same run, same instrument. So it's really the first multi-omic capable product that uh, can have high throughput and the sensitivity that's required for, um, for all these high complicated multi-omic kind of applications. So I turn around time to two, three hours. Uh, low operating cost, it's sort of in the realm of PCR, not NGS. Um, scalable number of targets, so depending on the application, you can uh, increase or have a limited number of targets, depending on what the application is. Very important. Testing is also moving towards going from tumor samples to liquid biopsy. As I mentioned, um, uh, cancer is a genetic disease, so the cells are in your blood, and it opens up, and the cancer DNA is in your cell, in your blood, and for that there's obviously a very low concentration of these um, cancer cells, <coughs> cancer DNA in your blood, so therefore you have, need to be able to detect very low allele frequencies. <coughs> Sorry. So scalable throughput, we can go from a small number of samples, let's say a hospital lab needs to have, um, need to do a quick test for um, you know, one, two or three patients can do that very cost effectively or do a full 96 well plate run. And um, <coughs> also very important compared to something like sequencing, very low input, we can use one nanogram of DNA. Sequencing requires typically an order of 40 nanograms, so small sample uh, size as well. <coughs> so that's uh, our story, very excited about it and uh, thank you for listening, appreciate it. <coughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, Michael, you're up next. Thank you for your time today. It's, uh, it's exciting to see all my colleagues here, what is being developed and brought to market. Um, a little bit about my background first, then I have a video to show you, and um, I'm actually open for uh, questions, so, so please do, do interrupt in, in the middle if you have a good question. I, I believe in, in not holding back, that's kind of a personality trait of mine. Um, I was born and raised back in Denmark. Um, I had way too much energy as a kid, hence the not holding back. I asked, I was one of those irritated kids that kept asking, like, how does this work? And like, why is it like this? And when, when, when you cut yourself, like, why do we grow back together? Because like everything else that breaks doesn't grow back together. And I was just, I was just curious, still am, can't, can't help myself. Um, and I was lucky that my first startup, where I got to serve together with some brilliant scientists out of Denmark, we, uh, we built a bioinformatics platform and teamed up with this little startup over in the UK called Solexa. You know that company as Illumina today. So we built um, a, a bioinformatics platform that, that took a new type of insight that this new sequencing platform was, was allowing for. Um, it was absolutely crap in the beginning. Not pointing fingers at, at, at Illumina Solexa, that was us and just the state of that when you build something new, 
it's really, really, really difficult when it needs to work for real. And real is a definition where you can set the bar at different heights. So uh, what I'm here to show you today is kind of a part of my life journey. I'm now on uh, startup number. I'm not even counting anymore. Um, and uh, trying to kind of push the limits for what is technically possible on planet Earth when it comes to doing detection of what drives biology. So um, just as a starting point, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it says BPU on the screen here. That's a reference to a CPU. So the same way the CPU gave us um, basically the digital world, uh, the BPU is, is an equivalent to how do we get close to the signals that drives biology. And that's obviously a, a high uh, bar to set and, and very futuristic. One, one of the leadership principles we use in the, in the startups that I get to, to serve um, is basically that we start with the end in mind. And wh where do we really want things to end? And if I take from a life perspective, I hope to be able to have played a part in furthered the understanding of how one of the most amazing things on planet Earth is life. How does life work? How, how does it even function that you can put a seed into the ground and you get a tree out of it? Because like, imagine this story of a new product being brought to market where somebody would come and say, like, I have this new product. You can basically take this little device, you put it, it I, I think it comes from Apple, maybe, I can't remember where it's coming from, but you put it in, in dirt, it order assembles into this structure that puts out solar cells and it produces apples. Of course, it's not from Apple, the company we're thinking about. It's just a seed, an apple tree I'm talking about. Like, that level of technology is not something anyone can right now build. But at the same time, biology does it all the time. Nature does it all the time. And we don't even notice that the most amazing things are happening around us. So I fundamentally think that biology have already built most of the things we need to solve all the big problems we consider kind of scary. We just need to learn from biology how to take those technology components, bring it over so we can, we can basically interface with it. So next generation sequencing was a part of that journey for me, learning a lot technology deep, like I'm curious, but I actually don't have a scientific or technical background. I haven't really gone to university. I have gone to a business university, but I was so busy with the startup that I didn't really participate in the classes. So I learn by doing, I learn by jumping out and being together with the best, brightest people I can find. And then my role is to serve them to perform the best, be the best versions of themselves and perform at what they're good at. So what I bring to startups is basically some leadership principles and some ways of thinking about the world that makes people uh, collaborate and, and lift each other. And with that, I've been lucky to have a number of uh, parts in a number of startups. And Career was uh, a startup that started um, from uh, some work Ross and Brett, who my co-founders did. And I was lucky to meet them when I arrived here in San Diego 10 years ago. L literally, the day I arrived in San Diego out of the airport, I ran into them. So sometimes it's also someone is taking care of like pushing me in the right direction. It's definitely not me being smart. It's, it's a combination of, of luck and combination of, uh, I just keep trying, so I'm not really lucky. I'm just like trying a lot of things because I'm so curious, so therefore I run into lucky situations. Um, Brett was basically theorizing that we could, um, we could investigate biosignals in a new way. This is uh, Brett's inventions, we can go into that a little bit later, but when I say biosignal, none of you have probably heard or thought too much about it. Today, when we talk about life science, we talk about data sets, it means we make a readout and we have some number. In this moment in time, you had this level of some proteins, some DNA, something. But what we actually need, really need to get to is biosignals. What is the signals that drives a certain problem or opportunity or, or, or positive thing? So, so that's a little futuristic to talk about. I'm talking about moving computers up to biology and biology up to computers. And if you have probably checked out your tomato, there's no USB port on it, so you can't just hook it up to the computer. But nevertheless, it is system of systems that are built biology, the same way system of systems builds complex technologies like computers and so on. So how can we bridge those two worlds? And I honestly thought we already had done it when, when next generation sequencing came around, but I started realizing these are data sets. It's not really too much coming from that because I want to know what's going on right now. I want to know what happens when I do something. 
So I got curious again. That we cannot cure, I'm afraid. So back at it, what is it that would take us to the next next generation of technology, where we would say biosignals, so data streams instead of data sets. And there was Brett standing in front of me and saying, is this new material called graphene? We can make electronics with it, but it's also biocompatible. It means we can take molecular components, DNA, RNA, proteins, so forth, we can make it a part of the electronics. And as you can imagine, as a curious person, my brain just went like, whoa, what does that even mean? How is that possible? And so forth. But um, that was basically how I got engaged and ended up as a co-founder of Cadea. Um, I'll take you through a video that explains some of these things. Um, this is a little bit of a futuristic talk. I have another side of me that is like, it has to be real and it has to work. And I want to define what work is. I don't set the bar too high because then we never make progress. So it becomes research tools in the beginning. It becomes like very concrete. I find some people that has a really worthy problem and then we go solve that problem. Um, often problems that have not been solved before because that's a part of the worthiness. Otherwise it's kind of all the hassle is, isn't, isn't worth it. So um, we'll talk about this a little bit after the video, but basically we build a CPU. We call it BPU because we can interface with molecular biology directly. We truly believe that biology is technology. It's just technology so advanced that we built it. We decided to take two of the heart. I'm just gonna let it buffer a little bit here and make sure we get sound up. Sorry about that. Money and figure out how we're gonna make this work, which sounds like a recipe for disaster. Turns out it worked and Putting those two together allowed us to really conceive of the technology now as a biosignal processing unit, something that directly integrates biology and digital systems to create a new type of technology that no one's ever been able to see. We're taking the strength of modern digital electronics and applying that to really integrated biological components. There's a number of measurements you cannot do today. If you want to know how an RNA binds to a protein, people will look at you and say, well, fortunately, you can either choose to look at the RNA or you can look at the protein. But that in-between state, because we only have sample preparation methodologies, as it's called, detection methodologies, that can do one at a time, you can't get the interplay between those two worlds. When we look at the traditional mid-20th century methods used to understand biology today, we're extracting from a cell uh, one element at a time, one protein, one set of nucleic acids, one small molecule, and trying to understand that one thing or couple things um, from uh, as a snapshot. What is needed is data streams, video instead of pictures, if you will, because there's so much more knowledge and understanding if you see things developing over time because we have a technology where the one side becomes a part of the electronics, the other side, by definition, is the signal. That's how we bridge the biological networks and the digital networks. For 40, maybe 50 years, people in electronics have been looking at incorporating biology into what they're doing. The issue is that typical electronics don't work well in salt water. So if you take a silicon transistor and you stick it in, in the most benign biological fluid you could think of, it will oxidize. But if you want to do something like look at what an enzyme is doing in real time, or do multi-omics, look at genetics and proteomics and metabolomics all at the same time, you need something that can do a field effect measurement and survive being put in salt water, or blood, or urine, or buffers, any of that kind of stuff. Bridging the gap between the silicon-based transistors and BPU using graphene, a wonderful material that is provided to us by nature, 
which is biocompatible, which is faster in transferring these electronic signals, so allows us to, to look at biological events in real time, can really expand the applications of all of these electronic gadgets that we have around us as a tool that can now be used to monitor our health. The process of developing this is a very complex process. It's not only going from genomics to phenotypes to proteomics. There's all of these events that are happening simultaneously that are defining the pathology that is causing that disease. If you can really tap into these multiple different biological events in real time and look at the interplay between genomic, proteomics, epigenomics, you can really understand the disease processes much better. Our role, instead of creating or re-engineering tiny robots, tiny systems. It's to work with biology, to use the technology that exists and figure out how to uh, integrate that. We've got this concept of a BPU, which is um, Biosignal Processing Unit. And this is the core of the hardware that's required to run the platform. The platform is the hardware, the BPU, the reader that controls the BPU, which you can think of as the chipset, but also the wetware. These components that can have meaningful two-way communication with biological elements and the software, the part that tells the reader what to do, interprets the signal, presents that information to the user. So the range of application can really vary from agriculture to molecular testing for disease diagnostics to quality control applications for CRISPR-based therapies and many others powerful applications of a multi-omics EPU platform is the ability to perform liquid biopsies. Liquid biopsies are very important for cancer diagnostics, where we need to be able to monitor free circulating DNAs, proteins, and other molecules. Imagine if we can do that all within the same platform and monitor how these you know, different biomarkers and the interplay between these different biomarkers play a role at the different stages of cancer development. We anchored the CRISPR within our BPU, which allowed us to actually search for our target sequences in real time. We've obviously done a lot of work with CRISPR, and the simple way to think about it is every biologist now can be a gene editor who understands basic biochemistry, now they can do gene editing. And now it opens up so many more potential applications and ideas uh, to just about everyone who can use a pipette. There are a wide range of applications for CRISPR too. This application ranging from wanting to do a rapid molecular testing, for example, in terms of detection of SARS-CoV-2. The process is super lengthy, you still have to do PCR amplification and it requires infrastructure. Imagine if you can do that in a handheld device using CRISPR, using biology as technology that could lead you to much faster response. In agriculture, for example, if a farmer wants to know if the seeds that they are planting is the right seed, they want to have a test that is rapid, that can give them a result in 20 minutes. CRISPR chip can offer a tool to monitor the efficiency of CRISPR editing before and after editing, to really look at the percentage of the cells that have been edited successfully. Now, today, there are companies developing therapeutics around CRISPR, there's all sorts of potential around diagnostics. They all got to get it right. The BPU is able to look at the CRISPR process at every step through the entire application. So we came up with our own QC methodologies to make sure we're getting good outcomes for our partners. It was a great way to showcase not only what Cardia could do, but then also make an impact in this emerging field that has so much potential but still needs good quality control. We also have developed a new version of CRISPR chip which can detect single point mutations. And as you know, 50% of human diseases are a result of single point mutations. So this could be very powerful technology for early disease diagnostics. Using graphene to bridge the gap between silicon transistors and BPU, now we have a gateway to biology. to show you the video because all the work is obviously done by my co-founders and our team and I'm just the guy running around making sure they have coffee and all the resources <laughs> to, to make the innovation happen. Um, it's also an interesting 
event um, to be at, talking about uh, disruption, and we talked amongst ourselves here, the panel, about what is disruption, what is the motivation that drives us. Mark and I just literally before, while we were eating, talked about like what is the face of the companies we like the most. And you said something along the lines, it's from zero to 50 people. Um, it's the exact same thing for me. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that now it works, and now it works in the hands of other people. And we have spun out a couple of companies from Cadea that is commercially using this technology in markets. Then it's actually probably better that I get out of the CEO chair and let someone that knows how to be really a CEO and, and driving from there. So um, I'm starting a new company next week. Um, so that also means I'm not going to be a CEO anymore. Um, so there's, there's uh, like real entrepreneurial spirit because I have that long-term thing that before someone puts me in the grave out in the future that I've done as much impact as possible. And I think if we humankind are to overcome what we are facing of challenges, we need to find a new way of making renewable resources. And as the internet taught us, I was literally my growing up, aha moment, resources doesn't have to be tangible. The internet is a resource that has done amazing things for the world, but it's really not that tangible, right? And the same way, and that's where the reference to internet of biology is that if I get to a state where I can kind of rest in the grave saying like, well, we participated in giving humankind the ability to understand how living things work fundamentally, and we can start using the building blocks of biology as hardware, as, as technology, as, as electronics, then there's going to be plenty enough resources for everybody. That's the future I would like to basically hand over to, to the next generations. such inspirational Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks uh, Ty for hosting us and Mark uh, introducing us. So uh, I'm talking about our journey that has started a long time back, seven years back. Uh, but as a company, we are very young and um, uh, it's been fascinating. It's uh, been educational. Uh, I come from a university background, have started companies here and there uh, during the journey. Uh, but this has been quite fascinating. And uh, I'll, I'll try to relay, uh, you know, what we are doing, what we are learning, and uh, you know, our passion for it, and our hope that this will really, hopefully, change the world. So uh, all of us have been aware of, if, you know, all the positive press AI has been getting, right? Uh, turn on any channel, turn on, you know, any social media, AI is all over. But we started, as I said, this journey long, long time back. And our early partners and our sponsors and collaborators had believed in this um, several years before ChatGPT came. So, uh, you know, one of the areas that we are focusing on is chronic conditions and how can we use AI to develop uh, meaningful, precise care techniques which will actually reverse the chronic condition and prevent chronic conditions to happen. I also wanted to acknowledge two of my co-founders who are sitting there. Hands up. So, uh, chronic care needs, really needs an urgent fix. It's not a marketing thing that I'm saying here. Uh, I was startled when we discovered, together with our early partner, Kaiser Permanente, how problematic this whole thing is. Uh, it's, it's just not in terms of numbers. You know, I've not even listed all the other chronic problems, you know, like mental health. It's not just the volume of numbers. It's not just the impact it is having on US and global economy. Uh, it's, it's, it can be devastating 
for so many individuals, families, and so on. And the problem is, as much as, and I'm really glad, you know, my colleagues here are focusing on, uh, you know, cancer treatment and so on. Those are really, really important things. But simple things like chronic conditions, there is very little, you know, uh, little progress made in the last several years in terms of how we manage things, how we provide the care. Usually the care is very generic. It's not precise. It's not focused on, you know, what, it, what is needed for you. It's very, it's very one, one size fits all. And the proof is in the numbers. 80% of, for instance, people who have blood, blood pressure have uncontrolled hypertension in US and globally. And similar numbers for diabetes, for mental health, and so on. The other big problem is, uh, so, you know, what I said is true that the care mechanism remains kind of the same, but there are attempts being made to disrupt and to figure out better ways of doing things. And one such route of doing things better is through remote patient monitoring. And uh, there are lots and lots of companies working on it. Uh, you know, a lot of healthcare providers around the world, not just in US, trying to look into it and adapting it. The problem is that remote patient monitoring produces a lot of data. But the eventual care needs to be delivered by who? By your physicians, by your clinicians, by the nurses, and so on. And if you ask anyone in the, uh, in the room that, who has been in you know, provider networks, that, that whole system is crumbling under the weight of high cost, unavailability of resources. And so remote patient monitoring is creating even more work for that whole system. And there's a real burnout. And I'm not inventing that term. Uh, you know, my colleagues, the partners in you know, the care community have been telling us that this is a real, real problem, burnout. And remote patient monitoring is creating more. Now, there is another parallel solution that is being developed. Uh, several companies working on it, and that is coach-based care. So essentially, human coaches will call you up, will figure out, you know, will gather data from you uh, through remote patient monitoring, and provide coaching every week, every month. But that's very expensive. Think about a startup or any other company. Having an army of coaches, it's like creating a parallel health system, right? And that's not a way to disrupt something because you're now creating an parallel system uh, and, and you know, it's not effective, it's not scalable. So what I'm showing on the left-hand side are some of those solutions. You know, in one bubble, I'm showing remote patient monitoring, many such solutions out there, many being tried out by, you know, as I said, all healthcare providers. But the burden lies in the care team, the clinicians, the physicians, getting burnt out more. And the other bubble I'm showing are companies like many of you actually know these companies, like the Larks and the Omadas and uh, Levangos. And they're based on human coaches. And they're burning money. And uh, you know, many of the companies have a lot of potential, but they desperately need help. Because you know, just using human intervention might not be the solution that scales. Now there's one company which is Twin Health and the reason I'm mentioning it is because it's not just offering generic care that many of these other solutions are offering, but it's offering precise care in terms of what kind of nutritional habits, behaviors may lead to better diabetes. So it's actually doing something really cool and getting a lot of traction. But the problem also is that they are relying on an army of health coaches, an army of doctors, and uh, you know, I would say it, it's a problem. They are raising a lot of funding, so they are getting very good traction. But we are doing something different. What we are doing is, uh, as opposed to generic care, and one of the aspects of generic care is that generic care not only burdens the health system, but also the individuals. Think about it. Many of you here have experienced the onset of hypertension or diabetes. And remember that the burden that it created on you, that you have to give up on high sodium diet or you know you have to get to low sodium diet, that you have to give up on carb, you have to do this, you have to do that. You know, there's a list of things that you have to do, right? It's just burdensome. It, you know, it sort of takes you away from the normal day-to-day -day life or stressful life that we have to lead. Um, and so, so because of that, it leads to low patient engagement, dropout, 
And that's what you know, many of these approaches are experiencing. Instead of generic care, what we are offering using AI is precise care, letting you focus on what is important for you and not, you know, not a one-size-fits-all kind of solution. This is leading to much, much better traction, much better patient engagement, and on the individual level, significant reduction in, for instance, blood pressure levels, and on a population level, 3x reduction in population chronic, chronic population, I'm sorry. Now, as opposed to primarily uh, human-based intervention, be it through the clinicians or be it through human coaches, we are enabling an autonomous care, but that autonomous care system is fully using explainable AI, which means that as we go out to the patient recommending something, we are fully able to explain why we are recommending this specific care pathway. And that is creating much better traction. First of all, it's not overwhelming for the patient. They are, they are asked to do just one thing and not 50 different things. And secondly, uh, you know, because we are being able to explain, we are getting their buy-in, we are getting their trust. And that leads to an amazing patient engagement. Uh, it's, a, it's a number that you know, initially no one believes. Only when you look at the data, then you start believing it's 90% patient engagement, whereas any other digital health techniques gets you to about 30, 40, if you're really lucky, to about 50%. And 10x reduction in uh, clinician workload. So essentially what we are enabling is a way to do things which is not going to break the system. If you have to disrupt something, you know, one way of disrupting is bringing the system to its to its knees, right? We are not doing that. We are enabling the system to disrupt it uh, in, a, in a much more smooth way by enabling it to do something at much lower cost but with much better health outcomes. So that's what you know, we are trying to do. So at the heart of what we do is this, and that is over years of research we have figured out how to take in data from, uh, first of all we have an app and through the app, we are collecting a lot of data. But also, any variable you device, any commercial variable out there, and any commercial uh, health monitor out there. Eventually, we'll get to patches and you know, all the other innovations that are happening there. We don't want to innovate. We, we want to use the innovation that the ecosystem is offering us. What we are concentrating on is this multimodal, multidimensional data sets that we are gathering in real time. And the ability to do feature manipulation and eventually data fusion through various kinds of late fusion, early fusion techniques in a way that allows us to create very, very precise individualized model for each of you. Each patient enrolled in our program will have a model which is constantly evolving, constantly learning about you. But also we are learning about the, at the population level. We are learning about, you know, the population level learning can be split up into various different ways, you know, based on ethnicity, age, gender, etc etc and using these models we are able to figure out very very precisely what is the correlation between what you do and what the chronic condition is and based on those insights that we are gathering we are also able to figure out what are the primary causes that cause the disease for you any kind of lifestyle disease we have started with blood pressure diabetes and i'll show you some the roadmap that we have if we are able to do that successfully, which we are, then we will be able to provide precise care pathways. So of all the different things that we are gathering from you, and uh, sorry I didn't elaborate much of the various kinds of data that we are gathering, all the usual suspects, I'm sorry, all the usual suspects from nutrition, sleep activity, various mental wellness factors, vital CHR, demographic, socioeconomic, contextual, your preferences and so on. And it's not like we are gathering all the data at one shot. It's a, it's, a, it's a gathering of data that is going on for days and months and years. And if you are able to figure this out, that is what is your primary cause, then we are able to figure out what is the precise care pathway that we can offer you. Instead of telling you 50 different things to do, we are able to focus you on just one thing. That gets, as I said, much better response, but even more than that. For instance, patient number one we are showing here, uh, it, for him, our analysis shows that awakenings, the number of awakenings during sleep is a contributor to, for instance, his blood pressure. 
and uh, so we can recommend him certain things but you know there are so many different ways of addressing this so we are able to because we are watching him getting to know a lot of things from him figure out that avoiding large meals before sleeping might be the way for him to do better for instance for another person maybe her stress is the main contributing factor and so we can focus her on stress for this week as long as stress remains their contributing factor, the biggest contributing factor. And then again, we are figuring out what is the hyper-personalized recommendation we can give to take care of stress. And because we are getting so close to a person's preferences and you know what they can do and not do, we are getting a lot of engagement and thereby good results. Now, so what we have developed is essentially a framework which allows patient TI collaboration. Those of you who have worked on uh, collaborative techniques between AI and humans, these are the most tricky collaborative technique because patient and AI, uh, you know, traditionally over the last 10 years, with the invent of digital health, have not really worked out well. But, you know, because of the various things we are learning and doing, for us it has been. And one of the keys to our success is that this patient AI collaboration is not unsupervised. It is semi-supervised because we have the clinician in the loop and how much the clinician wants to be in the loop will totally depend upon the clinician. We have, it can be a soft touch or it can be a very, very heavy touch. What we mean is when we involve the clinicians, when we send notifications to the clinicians, can be set by the clinicians, that is what, under what conditions. Uh, you know, when we get back to the, to the patient with this autonomous explainable patient engagement techniques, the clinician can oversee. For instance, if the clinician has, if you are a cardiologist and you have a patient who is enrolled in a program and you know you want to make sure that certain kinds of directions going to the patient comes to you. So you can do that using our platform. Uh, because you know, for instance, we may encourage the patient to increase their heart rate, uh, heart rate zone during activities and maybe the cardiologist may want to supervise that as an example. And in very few cases, the clinician or the physician will need to go back to the patient, maybe have them a telemedicine vi tele visit, or maybe have them do a real visit. It totally depends upon the, the clinician. So what we are doing is we are having this being used by the clinicians, by the care system, by the health system. So this is a very quick look at the patient engagement app. It has you know ways of uh, you know, we want to make sure that the patient is engaged with the AI by constantly interacting with the AI as much as they want to and the AI is interacting with them in a very autonomous way. So there are various knobs and various ways of doing this. And the explainable AI part, when we are going back to the patient with a certain, you know, certain guidance, certain recommendation, we are explaining to them very precisely, quantitatively, why we are asking them to do something. and. Uh, how, how we are asking them to do it. So let me quickly give some uh, uh, experiences from the field trials and pilots we have been running. One of the specific pilots is, is with UC San Diego Health, Population Health Service Organization. And we are showing here a set of patients, uh, 146 at this time, with a certain, certain uh, age demographics, gender, and about 86% taking medication. And we, we are, what we are showing is the progress in terms of what percentage of the population are in the elevated stage, which is less than 130 by 80, and what percentage of the patients are in stage 2. So our goal is to reduce that stage 2. And as you see that as the weeks progress, the percentage of patients in stage 2 keeps going down. You know, a little ups and downs, but you know, the trend is going down from 39% in week 1 to 24, uh, to, I'm sorry, 9% in week 24. Uh, so ours is a six month program at this time. And the, the patient population that goes up uh, in terms of just elevated or you can call it non-HTN uh, goes up from 26 to 52%. And how much is the real term impact in terms of the blood pressure numbers? At week 12, it's a reduction of 15 points uh, the systolic, which is very, very significant. 
And this is on top of medication. As he said, 86% of the patients enrolled in our program actually take medication. So, the other thing that I wanted to quickly show you is that uh, a comparison with today's techniques, today's techniques that are being deployed, not yet completely in use, but being deployed, this is remote patient monitoring. So we are comparing, uh, what we are take, doing is we are taking a sample set of 50 patients from our patient pool and 50 patients from the, from the remote patient monitoring patient pool, such that the week one profile of blood pressure percentages are the same. So that is for each of the 50 patients, the profile looks like stage two, there are 42% of the population in stage two, 20% uh, is non-HTN, not elevated, and 30% is stage one. And look at what happens at week 12. Our patient population, that is patients who are enrolled in our program, show a significant improvement in stage two population. And with RPM, it is better, but not so significant. But the more important thing to note here is that with RPM, Raymond said that it creates a lot more work for the, for the physicians or for the care team, in this case the care team. There were 150 care team interventions needed or outreaches needed, whereas in our case there are only four care team outreaches that are needed. So significantly lower, essentially a load experienced by the care team. And uh, the patient engagement remains amazingly good. 90% uh, uh, weekly average going over 24 weeks uh, as measured by how much they are measuring BP and synchronizing, how much they are syncing their variable, uh, you know, weekly basis, are they answering our questionnaire and so on. So very quickly, uh, what we are enabling is something that the health industry, the healthcare providers really want and that is achieving quadruple aim. And we are doing that while enabling much revenue generation by the healthcare industry in various different models. I'm not going to elaborate. And very quickly, that this is a really, really, from a business perspective, a really big market. Uh, unfortunately, because of the staggering number of chronic patients, uh, using a per member per month model, we estimate that about 43 billion in the US itself and 91 billion uh, non-US globally. And uh, we have various levels of interaction and uh, trials and a potential deployment coming out soon with our partners early, you know, late stage and so on. And uh, just showing very quickly that this platform is very, very extendable to the other chronic conditions. For instance, we are, uh, you know, while we have productized and are deploying uh, our hypertension platform, we are extending it with the help of uh, population health services uh, to diabetes. Uh, with another uh, partner, we are extending it to mental wellness and stress reduction. And uh, we have been performing actively R&D in mental uh, conditions like anxiety, depression, and ADHD. Uh, we have published extensively there. And so we have the goal of extending our platform to that also. Looking forward, we are really bullish excited. Uh, we, we want to touch at least 50% of the patients with hypertension and diabetes uh, by 2030 in the US and about 25% globally. That's why we are seeking out and we are partnering with global partners also. And something very passionate for all of us is that you know, chronic conditions are the worst in underserved populations. And so we are also working with safety net <coughs> providers to address that. Our goal is to make sure that we have effective chronic care, but low cost effective chronic care in the hands of the underserved populations. And by 2035, our goal is that we want to cut down the uncontrolled population, chronic population by half. It's a tall order, but we are very bullish and um, uh, you know, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? You have our website and email. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, come back up here. We're going to start the panel part. I'm going to start quickly um, with just a, a couple of questions. And this will be a lightning round. 
so let's keep all of the answers sort of to a minute or less. You had your chance to uh, give your pitch, and now it's sort of a lightning round. And I'll just uh, ask a few, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, I guess I need the mic. Uh, <clears throat> okay, in one minute or less, and we'll start with Peter and go this way. Um, how is your company or technology disruptive, and who or what does it disrupt? <clears throat> that, that was my presentation. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, the important thing is uh, that uh, technology like, like this can um, can really have an impact on, um, on on really quick diagnosis and um, getting patient care um, done effectively. So that's really the key disruptive element of our technology, but. Uh, but what's also very important about it is, you know, my background is technology, I'm an engineer. And uh, I know Sujit from, uh, and Mark actually from the telecommunications days way, in, uh, way back, you know, when I came here about 20 years ago. So it's applying some of the seemingly unconnected technologies um, into something uh, new. And, and that's what's really exciting about what we do is applying engineering principles, telecommunications to um, to, um, to biochemistry. Okay, while you're there, at yes. the mic, so you don't have to go back and forth, and we'll mm -hmm. just do it this way. Uh, the follow-on question to that is, in five years, what does the world look like different than it would be uh, based on your disruption? Yeah, I, I think that part of my presentation is, uh, you know, effective treatment. You know, people can uh, get the right therapy. At, uh, that's when they need it, and, that, and that's really the, the key to what we do. And I, I think maybe to extend on that, um, you know, COVID, as we all know, used PCR to do testing, <coughs> but that was looking for one target. Um, all these um, sort of new genomic applications like cancer screening, tumor profiling, uh, early cancer screening, etc., cetera, um, requires many targets to be detected. And that's why sequencing is used generally for this. Uh, so our technology is just making it sort of a streamlined race car version of, um, you know, sort of a, a truck, which sequencing is. It's, you can put everything in there, but it's slow and it takes a long time to get to where it's supposed to be. So we make the streamlined version. You make a fast truck. There we go. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Okay. Any other questions? Is that what you wanted to do? Uh, yeah, let's save the questions until we get through the, uh, no, okay. uh, no, go ahead, questions. Let's go. Okay, questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for such an, for your leadership for building such inspiring businesses. Uh, I have a question about disruption as well. So you've all talked about, um, you know, disruption is a great concept, and of course with it you build great wealth for your company, you bring excellent value for your shareholders, also to people, but there is a negative connotation to it as well. So it creates something great, but it probably puts many companies out of business, many people out of jobs or so. Um, so this month, uh, Harvard Business Review published um, an article about going beyond disruption. And so creating something which is like a new problem and others have not solved it. So that means that it creates something new, it's useful, but it also does not come with a ne negative impact on society. So my question is, have you guys thought about going beyond disruption and um, not like doing something which is better, faster, cheaper, uh, affordable, but addressing a problem that's just not addressed before and creating something that uh, not just creates value for your shareholders, but also stakeholders in society as well. Well, um, yeah, so quite honestly, I think what they're doing is certainly creating uh, something very useful uh, to society. Um, and, and, and I think the, the key thing here is that, um, you know, it provides uh, opportunities for care to 
to more people because it is indeed cheaper. Um, and um, you know, so I, I, I really think you know, new technologies always come along, but uh, I think when the internet started, and now with AI as well, you know, people think that we're going to lose a lot of jobs, which is certainly potentially the case. But if you look at technology and the way that it advances, it always creates more, more jobs and more opportunities, it's just different jobs and different opportunities. So um, I, I think um, especially doing innovation in healthcare creates um, a lot of ripple effects of um, advantages to everybody. Because in the end, you just have a, everybody has an opportunity to get care and a better life um, in a more efficient way. Anybody else with a difficult question? <laughs> yes, then, then take them yeah. now, please. Yeah. <laughs> take them and then the <laughs> ones. I have a question for the first speaker and the last speaker. Okay. Is okay? Um, <laughs> the first question is, I'm a, I've been a physician, primary care physician for many, many years. And your technology, your lab, you know, the science lab, you know that you know, it's phenomenal. It's when I started my practice, you know, I was using a lab, in-office lab, and I was doing a lot of tests. When the patient comes, we do the testing before the patient leaves, I do the batch. I'm talking about 25 years ago. But what happened was all the bigger labs, Quest Lab, LabCorp, and all those guys are getting upset about it. So they lobbied millions of dollars to our famous senators and congressmen. And they put more and more, you know, burdens to have a lab in our office. They increased the charges, they did a lot of regulations and everything, so that we could not even do any of the testing. My question to you is, if this particular lab is going to be available in physicians' offices, it's going to be phenomenal, phenomenal benefit for the patient, for the physician, and uh, unnecessary, we can prevent unnecessary repeat visits to the office and things like that. So, are you going to be working on that? Calming the senators and congressmen? Yeah. Yeah. Bribing them millions of dollars? It's actually something... <laughs> That's not bribing, it's called lobby. Royal no, lobby. I hear you. And it's something, thank you for the question and the comments and your experience as well. But yeah, you're, you're spot on and that is absolutely an area that we will need to migrate and emerge. Um, I think that what we've been focused on is, is really like we're never going to, like our goal is never to eliminate central lab testing. There will always be esoteric tests, of course, of course. low volume tests that you can do much better, cheaper, faster that way. But what we want to do is own the routine testing. The routine testing is so important and it's so critical because as you know, getting the information about your patient in real time is essential because you don't want to lose the patient. Once the patient leaves your door, you don't know what they're going to do or if they're going to come back. And so if you can have that information and that knowledge is really an important for you know, the consumer or the patient to understand, you know, what does this mean for me? What, what can I do to improve my overall health trajectory? And you know, my goal back to the, to the first question is really to you know, improve human um, health, right? And um, uh, elongate longevity. Um, and we need to be able to empower um, everybody in this room to understand what these health metrics are and what, what it means for them. Um, Actually, this is the 85% of all the tests this is what we do. CBC, CMP, yes. and uh, lipids and hemoglobin. Yes. This is what commonly we do. The so question for the last speaker. So, so sorry, let me uh, add something. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dina, but the FDA itself is sort of encouraging this, not resisting yeah. it. And, no, absolutely. And even in Toronto's day, you know, 10 years ago, they um, they had moved, at least in Arizona, to be from you could just go get it done without you know, the firewall of insurance and a doctor's script and so forth. So I think it's tilting the right direction, generally speaking. Right, right? and they, they skirted the FDA, and we've engaged directly right. and repeatedly with the FDA, so we've had, you know, I think 10 pre-subs with the FDA talking to them about our product and how it's going to work and the innovation of it and how it's similar or different from, you know, what's already on the market. And so getting that feedback early is going to 
help us position for success. But even through the FDA, I think you're right. Um, there is a lobbying effort that's definitely needed. But that that's needed. That was needed for um, genetic sequencing for prenatals too, right? That didn't happen overnight. I need <coughs> The primary care doctors and the uh -huh. Thank you. Well, right. one of the characteristics of disruptive companies is they, they kind of piss off a whole lot of uh, people. You know, think about Uber. They, they were, you know, none of the taxi or the government involvement in that or the medallions, and it was a big issue uh, for them for years and years and years, right? Because it disrupts a whole lot of people who don't want to be disrupted. So that's one of the characteristics that goes along with that. A question for the last speaker. Yes. Um, I we have been doing, I've been doing this uh, remote patient monitoring uh, for the past six years, okay? So I have, I had a company called WellConnect MDs. So not only that we were doing it, we were giving it to something like 25 different doctors' practices, okay? So we were doing that. The question to you is, we can do all those things, but only when we, when we have our medical assistants Call the patient, advise them about salt, salt restriction, communication, and uh, telling about the blood pressure control and all those things. And then if the uncontrolled blood pressure is there, to bring the patients in to the office so that we can do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and trigger their activities, including the stress level and activities and everything. Uh, whether I th we want, we'll tell them to document every single activity, including uh, getting yelled at by the spouse, write it down, so that we we'll see whether whether the blood pressure shoots up that particular time. The question to you is, we get reimbursed only for our staff's interaction, how many minutes they were interacting with the patient, only then we get reimbursed, okay? If it is going to be electronic and patient application and all those, it's a phenomenal thing, but at the same time, you guys need to lobby to saving senators and congressmen to get reimbursed for these kind of services. Because we have, it's an absolute thing that necessarily we have about three or four staff just calling the patients and communicating with them. Okay? So that is one of the thoughts. How do you, how do the doctors get reimbursed? Right. So good question. Uh, <clears throat> I have some insights. So there are, as you know, uh, various payment models, right? So the, our initial engagements are with value-based care, and uh, I don't know whether I want to, uh, you know, put a spotlight on someone sitting here. So, um, so there is Dr. Parag Agnihotri. Uh, he's the chief medical officer at Population Health, and what we are doing is the value-based care model. So that is one avenue, and then some of our other partners are more on the performance model, right, pay for performance model. For the, the CPT codes that you're mentioning, I'm absolutely sure, and there's a lot of chatter going on that they need to change. Why? Because they're actually stopping now CPT code payments because of the misuse, the amazing misuse that is going on, right? Uh, they, they created CPT codes for physical therapy also last year, and that's already under the scanner because, you know, providers are misusing it, uh, and, and so it should be eventually value-based, even CPT codes, right? I mean, what are the results of the, of the visits? What are the results of, uh, you know, the, the care that is being delivered? And what we are doing, we are generating really very, very impactful, meaningful visits. So we are cutting out all, all the costs, the waste, I'm sorry, and generating meaningful visits. By the way, using our platform, a healthcare provider, if they really want to do it, they can create as much business as possible. Why? Because we can create notifications for them and they can bring in the bring in for visits. But you know, we don't want to do that. We want to create more impactful visits. But your question is very relevant. Uh, but you know, that's why we are focusing on value-based care at this time. And uh, we'll we'll get to you know the visits. Thank you. Mark, I have a question for Sujo. Sure. Um, I thought the results from your studies were really remarkable. Um, the reason they're remarkable to me is because when I think about using an app to control chronic conditions, uh, my two immediate sort of thoughts or concerns are, um, are the patients going to um, be engaged with the app, patient engagement? Are they going to engage with the app? And are they going to follow the recommendations that come from it? And your results show that they are. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts as to why. why. Especially why do they choose to engage with the app? 
you know, uh, we had the, had the doctor over here talking about asking his patients to document every time a family member yells at them. And I imagine they probably didn't keep up with that, but they do with your app. And I'm curious if you have any ideas as to why. Yeah, uh, we do, because our initial clinical trials were abysmal failures in terms of engagement, and to the point where we were giving up. And so we learned, you know, more and more over years, uh, what are the things to do. One thing we definitely learned is that don't overburden them. Second, that, you know, if you give them precise things to do, they'll engage more. If you tell them 50 different things to do, they'll not. Uh, and the third thing is, if you explain to them why we are, you know, recommending something, that chances are they'll engage better. And so the combination of the three is what we hope. And of course, you know, we, uh, in the initial days, in the initial trials, there would be all kinds of failures. You know, there would be, uh, you know, registration failures, you know, problems with their bands, all kinds of mechanical and pseudo-mechanical problems. Today, we have become so autonomous that everything is detected. Sometimes even proactively, what's going to happen? So the patient, and if you ever use our app, you'll see that it's absolutely not burdensome for you. You will not get badges like you know Fitbit gives out for Paris and this and that. You will not get such frivolous things, but you get meaningful to the point things, which you know you see that it's improving something for you, right? It's like medication. Why do I take blood pressure medication every day? Because I know that if I stop taking it, there'll be a problem. So you know those kind of equivalents. But thanks for the question. One more. I have a question for Dan. Is this a 510K device? Yes. Have you submitted to FDA? We have not. So we've you only done that. pre submissions and basically Can you come to the the microphone, please? Yeah. The question was, is this a 510K clear device? It will be. Uh, we have not yet submitted and done our formal clinical study and submitted to the FDA. That's in plans for early next year. Uh, what's what's going to be the cost? To the cost of device. of the, the device? So the device itself is we're going to kind of leverage a reagent rental model, kind of similar to what they do with sequencers. So you place the device basically at no cost, and then it's a reagent rental for the consumables. So consumable would be the reagents? Those are the reagents, yep. How much does it weigh? The device? Yeah. Uh, it's about 50 pounds, from what I'm told. I haven't personally picked it up myself. I've helped someone pick it up. But <laughs> <laughs> Instead of micro titer plate, yes. you're using that circular yes. plate. How many wells do you have? There's 64 wells, um, so you can mix and match different chemistries, and that's, you know, the first panel has 32 assays, but we've developed the, pan the consumables to be extensible, so you can mix and match and add more later. Do you make the reagents? Uh, we uh, buy off-the-shelf reagents. We're not innovating in terms of the, the chemistries. That's kind of one of my tried and trues. But what we do is we get the bulks in and we formulate them so that we can stabilize them at room temperature Are they in the consumer. Yep, yeah. all all in the kits. Yeah. Good questions. Thanks. Yeah, and the cards. I won't say a number, but they're really low for the two plastic pieces in, uh, that you saw that are consumable. So they're quite affordable. Um, there's not much else cost you could take out of it unless you take the phlebotomist out of the process, and that may happen in you know years. Uh, out with uh, micro needle patches or you know that kind of thing. So, um, okay, should we continue to yeah. answer questions or sure. uh, yeah. Yeah. Next? quick right, one for Dana? So, are you also targeting uh, you know remote areas? For example, India has got anywhere from 600 to 1 million villages, right? I'm thinking this would be like a perfect opportunity, right? Are you also kind of uh, targeting those areas? Yeah, we've been really focused currently here in the U.S., um, but there is definitely opportunity to place this in, in other areas, and we've been looking at South Africa and other locations more globally. Um, I think uh, the one thing to keep in mind is that the system itself, it needs certain temperature and humidity okay. um, sort of controls, and so depending on the environment, um, we have to kind of take a look at that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it has a big window, but it's not going to go into 100 you know, degrees Fahrenheit type of location. I so think it's, uh, this is a, it's, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Peter, but there actually was a predecessor to the idea of Truvian, and Peter actually right. developed it for the South African market to go deep into the villages, and it's yeah. not nearly as comprehensive, but I think that's still yeah, out there. Exactly, right? yeah. 
and it's still running in South Africa. Yeah, but it's just a CBC test. Yeah. But yeah, that's sort of the genesis actually of all of this. And that works on a should mobile be phone with uh, cell phone camera. Yeah. Hmm. In your roadmap, do you also have uh, something for stools, stool biomarkers? Because I imagine between the stools and the blood, you know, tests, you're covering the whole gamut of most common and occurring diseases, right? Do you have any plans in that, for that for the roadmap? Yeah, the, I mean, there's going to be future panels. We're starting with wellness, just primary care focused, and really that's for, you know, chronic disease management, preventative kind of uh, care. Um, but then after that, you know, you can envision new panels, again, leveraging what we've already developed, but instead of, you know, the CMP reagents in here, you could have you know, a cardiac panel, a fertility panel, a woman's health panel. Um, one, of, one of the jets panels. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can add to that that there's a number of people around the world that is very seriously working on democratizing these kind of technologies. So uh, we've been lucky to work with the Gates Foundation, for example, that came to us and said, like, your technology, despite it not being diagnostic technology right now, it will have a potential future there. They would like to see that sped up uh, with the perspective of getting it in the hands of everybody. So um, uh, the Gates Foundation and a number of other foundations around the world are, are taking that very seriously, that, um, that there is a need. I, I personally, as we talked about a little bit, I, I work on things that can't be done otherwise, like as, as a mantra for pushing the technology. So if there's already something that works, then, then that's not that often where, where I put my, my effort. When, when, when that's said, there's actually a number of really disturbing lack of tests in the world. So if you think about uh, TB, for example, it doesn't really cost that much to treat if you know what version it is. So we have the whole TB problem. We already have the solution. We just don't know the mix and match problem. So, so that's, that's the kind of direction where, where the Gates Foundation are pushing technologies like us by saying, could you potentially go in and make a type of test that you, you won't be able to make today? That, that could solve those kind of problems. Because it's a real, real headache to think about all the TB that is around that is really, really making <coughs> havoc. Right? India specifically is, is a country where if you could just know who should get the right pill, then you could solve a huge, 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 huge problem. So um, that's, that, there's, the good news is that there's a lot of good people out there that is really leaning into to those challenges. So the overarching question. Did the pandemic help you as a disruptive? Because we are all health conscious now. There is the lobbying factor that you have to get around, but did it remove something so your disruption was easier? I don't know. What, what we see definitely is that much more willingness for providers to engage in what you may call disruption. Of course, you know, uh, in a way that helps but you know, things are now more open. People are more open to new ideas. Okay. Uh, I think that she was trying to ask a yes. question. To so is there, um, I lead biotechnology strategy for a major um, corporation. And what I'm finding out is for the smaller biotechs, capital is a constraint, but an even bigger constraint is availability of data. Are there any and you guys are going to generate a lot of data which could go into bench research for diseases and it could go to companies who, who can't afford to generate it on their own. Are there any plans to, de to democratize that data? Yes. Yeah, I may uh, say that, you know, it's uh, interesting how many times we are approached by, uh, you know, take your pick of the big techs and coming to us for data, we are surprised because, you know, uh, so we have been doing hard work for many, many years. And, uh, and, but that is a big advantage for a small startup like us, right? We have a, you know, huge advantage in terms of data because this data is not data out of uh, county records, you know, people who have already deceased. This is data that, you know, you need to collect you know, on a day-to-day basis for, for our kind of purpose. Right? And it's clean and structured. As an AI professional, I can see that. Well, uh, the data that we collect is very, very unclean, very erroneous. Uh, that's another IP that, you know, how to make sense of all that data. 
So the, the question is that should we give away all this data? Should we distribute all this data? The, the accommodation in me wants to, right? But just because for all the right or wrong reasons I've started this company, then you know data is our advantage also. So we have to obey these things properly. So, so may, maybe I can give a, a slightly different answer because we are slightly different, like uh, come from different places. And I actually want to start with your, your first question and loop it back to what you just asked him. You asked about disruptive, and and we, we got the homework here as a panel before we came to think about that. And I was like, oh no, I've never thought about that. And I was literally semi panicking until I was just like, that's that's just because I start with the end in mind. So we we think about who we enable. And um, I, I'm well aware that by doing that in, in my career, we have disrupted a lot of things, but we don't do it on purpose, and we don't do it with kind of like a, like, ha-ha, we are out for, for somebody's cake. Um, and, and that's true what, what Peter was saying, like it overall leads to, to better things because um, it, it opens up for, for new generations of, of opportunity and, and, and uh, more for more people. And it kind of loops back to what you're asking about AI and I, I think the conversation about AI, and you, you, you kind of lead to it with your question, is it, it's not just about big data sets. It's actually about the most signal in the data. Because otherwise, you, you, can, you can think of it like, if I were to build a house and I went out with an algorithm that can just like, take a lot of building blocks and build the house for me, I won't let it go and pick up on the basically um, to, to, to in, in the trash cans. Of, of, of building materials because I'll end up with, with a, a, a hard control. So I think a lot about how do we get to, to the to the biosignals, to, to the actual value contributor to, to what this is. It's kind of the same challenge you have. You're kind of going to people, you actually want them to feed you with the knowledge, the, 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 the important knowledge, including if it's the, the, the spouse yelling, which if that's important for the stress levels, like it's a real signal. But it might also be that it's actually misunderstood some of the things, so, so, so uh, leading the witness in asking a question that you can only answer yes to with and keeping your self-esteem and, and, and things like that. That's so, why I mentioned so, a lot of erroneous signals. It, it, exactly, I've heard you say that. So I, in, in, the, in the bio side of the world, when it comes to, for example, um, uh, drug development and, and like deep analysis, I think what we will face the next five, ten years, especially with the new AI tools coming out, is like, the people that have access to data, that's your question. Yes. The combination of having access to data, but actually shielding the models from things that are not relevant. So it, it's not any longer the, the big data thinking of like the more the better. It's actually more about the purity of your sources. And another, it, with the risk of getting a little philosophical here, the more perspective you can get on the same problem that are not directly correlated to each other, you will get the more signal from that. So so that's that's leading to, to Peter's arguments with, with multiomics. If you can have a cancer, um, uh, lung cancer, where it's cell-free DNA, but also sneak peeking at if the immune system is, is going crazy. Because otherwise you can have these risk cases, and I'm kind of, uh, I happen to be in the liquid biopsy uh, space before uh, this thing, so it's, it's near and dear to my heart, that, that you, can, you can have cell-free DNA from, from cancer, but it's actually there because my immune system killed the cancer cells this morning. So now I have this signal that is typically correlating with having a cancer, but I have it because I don't have a problem. And the poor guy over here that never has that signal, he gets it in six months from now and six months after he's dead. So, so how do we even interpret these signals we take out of it? And, and that's, that's what I think AI will actually help us with because AI is, is just, and, and I actually don't use the AI phrase if I, I can avoid it, it's just pattern recognition. It's just taking a data set and based on the patterns, letting it make a mathematical model and it can be much, much smarter than, than a human that can't consume over that data that fast. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I think a lot of our uh, entrepreneurial challenges that the coming five years is, is going to be to kind of limit the, the, the input sources so, so we don't confuse the artificial intelligence as much yeah, as... I would just uh, differ just a, so we cannot, we shouldn't limit 
but are there, think about it, in your AI system, are there AI bots walking around the data and figuring out, you know, making more sense of the data? So it's AI within AI. You know, you have to have your agents walking within the data sets to figure out what data is relevant for this particular situation versus the other. Well, but I think you so, agree with, with based on, on your presentation, that you have structured <coughs> approaches. You have a doctor sitting down saying, this is actually the kind of things, you, so, so you get guardrails on, that, that's kind of what yes, I'm... Yes, yes, good. So, so, you know, I think that human experts, experts making sense of data, but not in a manual way, because if you have to go through the, all that, you know, zillions of data, right, you cannot. So that's what I'm saying, that can you create AI techniques within AI, so that you know you make sense of data because if the data sources are if you're misinterpreting data that's the worst thing that you're doing right okay over here yeah. Yeah. hi guys um my name is nolan and uh, professionally i'm an enterprise architect um, so i work in business and technology integration and uh, i'm really fascinated by the vision of the connected world so my question is for the ceo of uh, carrera um, you said a lot of things which are really near and dear to my heart about um, nature kind of almost being like the original algorithm and that like looking to nature for inspiration, um, biomimetics is a huge part of what we do. So my question for you is um, how are you inspired to take this biomimetic approach uh, to developing your VPU uh, system and uh, do you think that can also connect into a larger vision of like internet of things, uh, technologies as well? So I'm not just <coughs> one of a number of people that are behind Kadea. And, and I don't want to take the, the kind of the, the, the credit for it. I personally understood that because next to where my parents live, and I grew up, there was a farmer. And that farmer was the old style farmer that was well aware that what is trash in one type of animal is, is a resource for the next. So that whole system of systems, he taught me. He, he was a guy that had never gone to school by the way. So, so I also think sometimes Kind of getting other perspective on things is is, is very healthy. Um, so so I, I got inspired by nature because it was by the way also that farmer that had time for little curious as Michael's why 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 questions. He actually took the time and said like well the reason why we keep these things separate is because they can actually carry over diseases, but these diseases can't carry over and what is basically poop over here is is fertilized over here and its growth over here and and, and comes back. And, and the way of, of farming, the old traditional farming, before it was factory farms, they actually understood this. And, and he knew it from his father, that basically for generations. So that's where I passionately started understanding the, the system of system things and the fascination of, of biology and nature started for me. And then I've just been around some really, really smart people. I, I love being around scientists because they are a hundred times smarter than I am, and I get to be the guy that says why, 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 all the time. And then maybe I have a little bit of skill of getting people to work together, and then when I've heard all the whys, I can tell the story in, in some of the, the phrases you heard on, on the video, so that it's it's easier to consume. Hi, uh, my name is Jason. I'm from Google. Uh, I have a question for you. You know, unfortunately, Ferna has left a lot of Black spot yes. in this technology. How do you overcome the suspicion in the marketplace? And secondly, <laughs> if we have submitted for FDA approval, what kind of data you have given to the FDA? Have you compared a large sample with the Quest on different uh, parameters? And what were your findings? Yeah, so let me answer the second question first. So you, so you asked what data have we submitted to the FDA? So we've just uh, just finished uh, doing an internal study as well as an external study where we sent our devices out to a clinical trial site and basically we enrolled 258 patients where we collected three tubes of blood, two tubes went to LabCorp and was run on standard central laboratory analyzers and then that third tube went to Truvian and was run right on site. And so that is the white paper that we've just finished and we'll be presenting that at AACC um, in July. Um, the actual clinical validation study is, isn't scheduled till next year and that's because we're still refining and finishing development this year. So that's the second question. Um, first question I think was about Theranos and how we overcome 
you know, the, the skulls along the way. Um, it's funny because in the earlier days, as, you know, Theranos was unraveling, um, it definitely created a lot of uh, hardship for Truebeam because that was the time that we were trying to raise our Series A financing round. So we had, if you remember uh, my story, we had $2 million seed that was uh, provided to us in uh, late 2015. A month later, Theranos started to unravel and essentially that $2 million was supposed to last six months. We were going to just license some technology, show feasibility that something like this could work, and then we were gonna go raise a larger round and bring that money in. And what ended up happening was no one wanted to touch a Theranos-like story. And so uh, six months turned into two years. And it was really, you know, the dedication of like our co-founders, our uh, seed investor, Kim, um, and that really we believed that we could overcome this and it just took time. Um, and we were able to um, generate enough data, the bar was so much higher, generate enough data and we closed our round, even though the company was formed in 2015, we didn't close our Series A until January 2018. So that's kind of one way that uh, we were impacted um, by Theranos, but I think from our standpoint is, you know, we, we learned some lessons from them, like what not to do, like be transparent, you know, talk about the data, let the data drive decisions, um, you know, uh, run studies, uh, talk about your data. Um, and so we're not shying away from that, even though we're not uh, all the way there with all 32 tests, the majority of them work, like just like Central Lab, there's just a couple that we're refining. Um, but I think that's part of development, and you shouldn't, you know, shy away from talking about data in full, whether it's good or bad. It's 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 not. It's not good or bad. It's what it is, and it tells you where you are and what you have to go. Would you allow FDA to come in in your lab? And oh yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I don't know I'm if like they want to, enough. but if they'd want to. But we've had nine um, uh, dialogues with them over the last several years, so they are very familiar with our technology, our approach, our intended uses you know, the technology, what we're doing in our clinical study next year, all of that. Yeah, I'll, let me comment too, because I, I was just there a couple of years and, and left, and I was on some of those fundraising uh, <coughs> roles up in uh, Silicon Valley, and it, there definitely was uh, no, no VC wanted to be the next guy that invested in the next Theranos, right? Um, but eventually we melted the ice and got money. But I, I would say on the positive side, uh, Theranos spent a lot of money uh, selling this vision that, you know, just a few drops of blood, you can, you know, get tested and it's going to be in retail. And they sold that to consumers. They sold it to a lot of retailers. Uh, so we have a CDS person on the board. They still need this vision that was sold to them by Theranos. They didn't close up shop and say, ah, forget about diagnostics in the, in the pharmacy. They want it. And so that void has not been filled, but it was created, the vision was by Theranos. And um, I also believe that, you know, all the press, negative press they got has a pot, it's, it's got a, a uh, absolute value that's sitting in the sky in our public consciousness. And as soon as this works and it's through the FDA, if we were just a company that came along and vented it, we wouldn't have this, you know, if you put a price on all of the press that they got, the books, the movies, it was negative, but it has absolute value that could be positive, and it's a lightning bolt that I think is going to come down and hit truly in, in a positive way because the public consciousness about this vision is there. It's just it turned out it was a fraud. Now, Truvian solves it, and all that negative, I think, turns into a positive. We don't have to go buy that. PR and that marketing, they created it for us. The world created it for us, and it's there. Free so, marketing. Yeah. Free marketing ahead of your your positive result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more here. Ben, I have a question. You mentioned AASTC. Yeah. Have you done a demo yet? Have we done a demo? No. We have you not. have not shown it at AASTC? No, we have not. No. Uh, and the study that was done, was it done by you or no, through a CIO? No, independent. Had a CIO. Clinical trial site ran the study, um, produced the results, and analyzed the data. Thanks. Yeah, and as a predicate device, you know, it's just each test has a range that, you know, if you run the same, 
blood on the same machine, you're going to get a different answer within a range. And, and we just have to be, it's quantitative. And so it's, uh, we're, we're close. One more. And I think after this one, maybe, uh, how close are we getting? It's getting late, I think. Maybe one or two more questions. I'll make it very short. Okay. I think all of you are serial entrepreneurs. And I'm not sure how much money you have raised, but if there are some chances are some of you are going to go IPO, uh, raise some more money. Uh, if all four of you could talk about the opportunities, you know, this is a large brain trust here. If there are any opportunities for us to be engaged with you, uh, talk about it. We'll be taking uh, checks at the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can Second we all get the stock option? <laughs> <laughs> we'll follow up with the paper later. Like to share with those opportunities with us. And um, I think it's been a very exciting presentation. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. You guys are not exactly early stage startup, so I think you are you are a long way uh, to productization. I mean, you're already there. Um, anyhow, that's so. Share with us how to how to become engaged with you. I, I say come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do the paperwork later. Just give us the checks tonight. <laughs> can, I, can we come back to the question that the sure, lady no. over there asked? Yes. Uh, because I think that you know it's a very relevant question, and you asked the question about disruptive companies, and uh, you know trading off between disruption and the value it brings versus the job loss. And uh, you know I participated in many panels, uh, AI panels, because that's my specialty, and. Um, you know, I think that it's a three-dimensional problem. One is, of course, the, so for instance, in any of the companies here, that, you know, essentially we are going to help in the, improving the health of a lot more people than otherwise would have benefited, right? Timely healthcare, you know, expansive, pervasive healthcare, and so on and so forth. But uh, you rightly pointed out that, essentially, what about jobs lost? So as I, was, you know, as I listened to your question, I reflected. And I was trying to come up with an answer that for our model, you no, know, actually we'll create more jobs. But cannot, because you know, 10 to 20 years from now, instead of a healthcare organization hiring 50 more uh, you know, care team members with our technology, they would do with the current size, right? So they would be able to right size. So I cannot argue on that front. And so what is the solution there? Uh, and the third, of course, is all the disinformation that, you know, the bad actors that can use everything that we are doing and create, you know, other kinds of societal challenges or economic challenges. So it's a three-dimensional problem. And the only reason I uh, thought of reflecting on this is that, you know, it's a great topic for Thai to have a meaningful panel because, you know, one of the things that I mentioned as I participate in various AI panels uh, is that it's up to technology leaders like us to come up with solutions. I don't think our political systems, maybe even the economic systems, will be able to resolve this uh, in a meaningful way. You know, the technology leaders and you know, creators of companies, innovators, and so on, should be trying to understand you know, what are the right ways of doing things. Just wanted to, you know, no, I cannot offer a solution. I don't have an answer, but you know, I think it's definitely important for us to reflect on it and try to come up with some policies or you know, ways of doing the right things. I'll, I'll come on that too. I, I'm a believer in you know, creative destruction is valuable. <clears throat> and I don't think you can hold that ocean back in any way where you're like the old Soviet Union and you know, it just, it, 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 everybody's equally, you know, it's, it's the Darwinism of innovation that continues to make, you know, and it always, it doesn't always, you know, it's not always benign or positive. Sometimes there's a negative effect. You can think about, you know, problems with social media and with uh, lots of technologies. There's upsides, but there's always downsides. And I think as technologists, that's where we have to think about what we do. But just the creative innovation itself is going to cause destruction, and that's part of it. And when Peter puts his competitors out of business, they're going to all go work for him. Uh, you know, the employees, right? So 
Um, anyway, that's my thoughts. That's what that article really argues about, that yes, there is creative destruction and it comes with destruction, but there can also be non-disruptive creation as well. And both of these need to be taken together. So for example, when Amazon comes and all the retail stores are everybody, <coughs> or when Uber comes and all the taxi drivers are losing their jobs and so on. So can there be these other non-disruptive? Uh, and so the examples that they were discussing, for example, they talked about like Square. And so the credit card industry, it's not disrupting them. It's just opening it up to a whole new group that would that would not be using any sort of service or so. Or they were talking about like, um, uh, for example, uh, how we generate funds for startups through venture capitalists or so. And when Kickstarter comes in, it does not disrupt any of that industry. It just opens up like millions and billions of new funds that can um, enable all these uh, entrepreneurs and so on. So it's, I think it's a very powerful concept, and um, but I know that most of the businesses, uh, they generally are looking at like finding a better answer to something that's all right. But thank you so much for reflecting. Okay, uh, one last question, or we? Uh, no, go ahead. One last question, Jerry. <laughs> okay, Let's, I'm gonna try to keep this brief and fun. So at what point do you look internally and say, I actually have to go to market? And what kind of capital constraints and turmoil in your teams does that create? I mean, you can, every company up here is right to be acquired, do something really positive and really powerful. But through that process of pivoting, you always get to that capital constraint problem and that point where you go, my God, I might have to execute on this. What's really going to happen? And how do you handle your teams? How do you communicate that tough stuff to keep everyone going and motivated? I, I, would, I would like to open up the very, panel. Very quickly, I'll take that. I'll take a first stab. Is it's it's developing the perfect product versus developing the first generation product that's going to be impactful as it is. And I think that's the dialogue that we have a lot internally with our team. Is you know we're thinking about the second gen, third gen, fourth gen, um, and what this technology can become. You know, kind of five, ten years down the line. But the most important thing we can do is to have the minimum viable product that will truly, in itself, be disruptive into the marketplace. And so you have to have those trade-off discussions. Um, otherwise, you know, you could be stuck in development for, for a long time. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, so our instrument's about this big. You can probably shrink it down to this size, but what's the point, you know? It's probably gonna do the same thing a little bit faster, but the delta between, um, you know, what we do now in a non-ideal form is uh, much bigger than um, the delta of shrinking it down and making it better. That's certainly a roadmap I do. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just getting something out there and very important to get it in customized and getting that feedback because that sort of guides the, the next generation of products. You know, one of the experiences I've had as an entrepreneur is that um, so your product management team, your sales team, your business development team comes back and says that uh, our customers are saying that, you know, only if you add this feature, only if you extend it to this, right? This is a known problem. And uh, success in entrepreneurship and, you know, successful execution, I think, leads to the right dialogue with your customers. You know, be they, I'm talking about B2B business models mostly, where, you know, you convince them that this is the right product for you. And we will definitely, we are definitely paying attention to your needs, and we will get those additional features in time, and so on and so forth. Right? Sometimes we fail to do it. Sometimes we get lured by, uh, you know, getting to that moonshot. But uh, I totally agree with uh, you know, and uh, Peter that you know, if we can keep it focused, sell what we have as opposed to uh, going for the moonshot. Yeah, I think another important thing is with customer feedback. Most of the time, customers don't really know what they want. Yeah. So if you, if you have to give them something and then they can tell you how it should be different. So that's why it's important to get that first product out uh, and get the customer feedback. So we, we use a slightly different methodology. Um, we, we have some leadership principles we follow and um, 
one, one of the things is basically that we, we, we take what seems to be an internal opportunity and then we, we push it out to many more people than our IP attorneys are comfortable with. So they're always kind of sending that out tomorrow, like the, the patent application has just been sent in. It's like, yeah, because why are we waiting? So, so our methodology has been to push it out in publications to spark people um, because P Peter is pointing something very important out here that it's actually very difficult to go out with something and get that customer feedback. There's one exception to the rule. That's when somebody comes running into your office and goes like, I will give you anything for you to solve this problem. Can this thing do that? And that, that's where I fish for my minimal viable products. And, and the reason why we have products in the market is we, we literally found a, a niche market where there was such a high demand for what we were doing that they were li willing to live with our shitty first versions of, of the chips that does make mistakes and so on, but a 80% uh, success rate, 20% failure rate that is like, think about that in diagnostics, that would be horrible. But if, if you're in an industry where you can't do a measurement and you're literally, literally risking people's lives, if, if you don't get some kind of insight, then 80% all of a sudden seems like a lot. That, that specific company I'm talking about, we, we spun out is CRISPR QC, so the ability to see CRISPR at work while, while you're using it for, for gene editing, and therefore removing a lot of the, um, let's say, the, the, the risks associated with changing the source code of life in humans. That's what we're doing with CRISPR. There's no way you have insight to that. Literally, you're doing the gene editing, and you're seeing the outcome. And this is in patients, in trials, we're doing that without any safety net. So being able to take a not fully ripe technology and making a safety net that maybe has a couple of holes still, it's a startup, right? It's much better than nothing. So, so that's one of the reasons why I'm adamant about if there's something already, like I don't, I don't dare to push it out as fast as I like pushing things out because I like basically forcing innovation. And that actually answers your question that I don't think we, we answered. Uh, what can you do? Um, it's actually giving us the kind of attention. So, so it, it's, it's, not, it's not a check. F follow us what we do. We, we put these videos out for a reason to communicate because we are looking exactly as you say for brain trust. It's, it's, it's talented people coming and joining our course because that's another answer to your question like we, we see this as a course and not just a a kind of like this is a product so, so it's a slightly different way of of doing things but it's um it, it it it's definitely different thing was like i'm definitely not getting close to the fda because they would look at me and see just like a guy <laughs> being all over the place and go like what are you even talking about because i don't want to lock down the innovation that it takes, the, the, the rigor that it takes to get all of those tests working on one device, I'm just like, I can't even imagine your headaches. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. We, 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 we play different roles in life and uh, ho hopefully we get to, to empower great entrepreneurs in this room and, and, and around the world. So the way I convince my team, that was the core of your question, to do these scary things is basically, we, we, we can't fail, you can fall. But then we get up again, and, and the difference between that is, is where I dare to play in that, where everybody says, like, this is so risky, that's the moonshot with the moonshot on top that we're attempting here. It's just like, yeah, but there's nothing else. So it's kind of like already failed by where we are. So let's, let's go and fall a lot, because that's, that's still better than, than not. So it, it's different, different levels of aggressiveness in, in, in entrepreneurship and innovation, and, and it allows us to play slightly different uh, games. I'm, I'm one of the guys that struggles with raising typical VC money because they basically go and say, like, Michael, that's halfway just research you want to do there. That's like, yeah, that's true, but like, otherwise, how are we going to get there? But then sometimes we team up with great people from the universities, and, and that, that's how it ends up rolling anyway. The rest, do you want to close this out? Or yeah, we... yeah. Uh, uh, you want to take a picture? No, I'll take it after. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for staying this late. Uh, I really appreciate it and all the interest that you've shown. I think these folks might stay around for a little bit so that uh, you can have one-on-ones with them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think going back to the question that uh, Arjun in the back had asked, how can we help? 
I think in the past, what we have done is we have helped um, some of these companies in capital raise, in board formation, in uh, establishing relationships, in uh, m and I mean, several aspects of entrepreneurship. And going to that, uh, our next event is going to be around m and So that's entrepreneur's dream. Uh, so how do you prepare for, uh, for an exit? What is your valuation? What do you need to do in terms of your IP strategy? And then how do you go about preparing for that? And then what happens after an acquisition has happened? The integration, the boring stuff. Sometimes you know you don't like the culture, the culture fit, all that. So we're going to talk about that. So next event is on that, and we'll send you more information on that. But uh, I want to thank all these panelists. Really, really, I think we achieved our goal of showing you what a disruptive innovation is. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sujit. Thank you, Dina. Dina had, you know, I mean, she has two little kids. She is spending time with us, you know, but I, I really thank you for that. And uh, Mark, you've been a star. Peter, thank you so much.